It's Cowboys vs. Eagles week, and before we preview this week's matchup with the help of Jane Slater, predict the score for me, Cowboys vs. the Eagles, in the comments section right now. You're watching the Cowboys Report. I am Tom Downey, and helping me out today to preview this week's matchup is Jane Slater. Jane, thanks again for coming on the show. We appreciate it. I love just talking Cowboys, and I love talking about them after a win. It feels like a long time since we've done that. It, it really does, and this week's matchup is an important one with a lot riding for the NFC East as well, Jane. It is. I mean, if you think about it, you've got two teams, one and one. And more importantly, this is the Cowboys home opener. And what a good one. Monday night football in Dallas. Uh, Cowboys getting their confidence and their mojo back. Although, what a crazy game. I don't know how confident I am after seeing some of the officiating calls and the way it ended. Uh, but I am seeing signs of life from this team. And especially when you see what the 49ers did to the Eagles. Maybe this one feels like it's got a little bit more of a level playing field. Because I got to tell you, after watching the Eagles in week one, I started thinking maybe I'd underestimated this team in the division this year. Uh, they came back down to life a little bit. I, I felt the exact same way about Philadelphia. Let's focus in on the Cowboys and the return, at least, of Randy Gregory. So after several days in a row of losing key players, the Cowboys set to get one back this week. And, of course, that brings up the question, Tom, what do you do with Randy Gregory, especially when you saw what Micah Parsons did? And I don't want to steal your thunder here, but I do know that it's going to be a talking point for a lot of us throughout the week. Randy Gregory is certain a guy that, certainly a guy that has proven he can get to the quarterback, uh, but Micah Parsons sure proved that he was a heck of a disruptor. Jane, do you have any insight in terms of what could be the path here for the Dallas Cowboys as it relates to utilizing Micah Parsons and utilizing Gregory? I don't think you should commit to putting Micah Parsons in any one place. I know a lot of people are talking about this possibility of mm -hmm. Dia keep him on the end there, seeing what he was able to do uh, against the Chargers. I mean, he's proven so athletic. You can put him in so many spots. I talked to DeMarcus Ware about this last week. He thought that he should be used very similar to the way that he was in a 3-4 system that favors one-on-one -on -one matchups. And then, of course, you've got a guy that's constantly getting to the, the – the quarterback, which is essentially what he did last week, and it worked. Uh, in terms of utilizing him in other roles, I think the big concern, I know one thing that you had mentioned to me ahead of this show, and again, I don't want to steal your thunder, you said, what about you're using good. him as a spy? And there's a lot of people talking about that this week. So you're very smart, Tom. Thank you. There are people considering it. But I reached out to, again, people smarter than myself, uh, defensive coordinators in this league that I highly respect, mm -hmm. and their thought on this was, it's something you should consider but not fully commit to. In other words, find somebody else to be the spy. Disguise him as best you can because he might be your most favorable matchup for a running back, say, Miles Sanders or a tight end. And in this case this week, likely not Zach Ertz if he doesn't get out of COVID protocol, yeah. but maybe Dallas Goddard. Bottom line is let this kid roam. He told us on Hard Knocks, he's like a lion. He's always hungry. Keep him hungry. Give him a lot of options on his plate. Don't just give him steak. Very much sounds like a chess piece player for this Dallas Cowboys defense. So we want to hear from you guys now in the comments section. Where should Micah Parsons play? We'll throw in the most here. Type DE for, you know, defensive end. Or type LB for that off-ball linebacker role. If you want to type in both, I'm not going to complain either. Get your votes in for us right now in the comments section. You mentioned the Eagles, how they've looked a bit better than maybe expected, especially back in week one. Jalen Hurts, and historically this Cowboys defense has not had the most success against mobile quarterbacks. Better the last time they saw Hurts. What are you expecting out of Hurts this week and how the Cowboys are planning to control and stop him? Not just Hurts, but Miles Sanders. I mean, I think the big thing for these linebackers has been they have not been great at stopping the run. Although I would go and look at week one, what they were able to do with Rojo and Leonard Fournette. And then we didn't really see the run game with the Chargers get going. So at least I've got some confidence through two games. But again, it's only two games. And I do think because you've got so many young defensive players on this staff, maybe there's not a lot of film about them out there just yet. We do see in this league, give opposing offenses enough tape. They start to pick up on tendencies. So I don't want to get over my skis on this defense <laughs> just yet. But I do think it was really impressive that, that given the fact they not only lost two defensive players, but an assistant defensive line coach and their strong safety last week, that this defensive side of the ball was able to adjust midweek and do so admirably on the road. 
I want to spend some more time here on Micah Parsons as well. Uh, overall, with how he's played this year, feels like he's exceeded expectations to at least a pretty decent degree so far, Jane. I think that's absolutely fair. Uh, I think there are so few rookies, especially defensively, that come into this league that wow us, right? Uh, there's a hype train when it starts with guys in high school and then college and then certainly in the NFL. And this was a guy that didn't play a senior year at Penn State, remember? So you just didn't quite know what to expect. And then we're putting all this stuff on his plate. But I thought the big stuff that stood out to me was the way he so quickly earned the respect of his teammates. That's not easy to do. You got to earn the yeah. star, right? Uh, he was always that sort of felt like, and I've compared him to the annoying little brother that just always wanted to be around, but good on him for forcing it. Remember at camp, he was the one yeah. that told Demarcus Lawrence, hey, I was a five-star defensive end in, in high school. And he brought that up to the staff and the staff worked with them. And then it was even... I was covering the preseason game against Jacksonville, and there he was working out with the defensive ends and the defensive linemen on some of his swim moves. It all paid off. And so, Sora, I, I, I honestly feel like, feel like him getting ahead of it, it's almost like he had a premonition that he might have to at some point. Uh, but I love that he did it. I love that he got some of that work in. And from that perspective, even there was a comment that he said about two weeks ago, in college, you're not getting paid to just do football. Some would argue that you are. <laughs> but you're not getting paid just to play football. And now that you get to focus on what you're getting paid to do, he spends 24 hours doing it. It certainly looks like he watches a lot of tape because he hasn't been a reactive player to me. He's been a very much a proactive player. All right, so get your votes in for us, folks, in the comments section. Grade Micah Parsons so far this season. A small sample size, but still pretty impressive. A, B, C, D, or F. Get those votes flowing right now. Now, today's show is helped out by our friends over at Magic Spoon. Get $5 off your first order of the perfect blend of health and taste. 13 grams of protein, only 4 grams of net carbs in each bowl, and despite having zero sugar, this stuff tastes absolutely incredible. There are tons of flavors from frosted to fruity to the blueberry, cocoa, cinnamon, maple, waffle. That stuff smells incredible as well. Get $5 off your first order, magicspoon.com slash cowboys. Let's head now to the Zeke and Pollard discussion because that one isn't going away anytime soon. Although I think a bit of a good problem to have, Jane. It is. And the problem I just don't want to have as a reporter is constantly explaining to fans why the Cowboys can't just dump him or trade him. I would point out to you, remember the Rams moved off Todd Gurley. Atlanta picked him up. Go ask Atlanta if they would make a trade again for a running back in the area of $12.4 million. That's essentially what you would be doing is another team would have to not only agree to pick up his contract, but then renegotiate a contract with what many would consider some tread on the tires. I like him in pass pro. Even as Tony Pollard had said, they're always going off who has the hotter hand. Clearly, Tony Pollard, I mean, when you look at his, uh, his, what is it? Where is the word? I'm like, the yards per carry were out of control. Every time he had the ball in his hands, he just seemed to really do something with it. So it does feel like he has more pop. But I also think people are forgetting a lot of the things that Zeke does that's not in the box score. Something I spoke with him specifically about last week. And a lot of people I talked to agreed with it. If you think that he's not affecting the game, then you essentially need to study football a little bit more. Because if you go back, pop in the tape, show me and tell me where he isn't helping out your quarterback get some of those passing plays done. I know he was big in week one, and that I would say that he sort of set the tone for Tony Pollard to get going as well. But I get people's frustration with the fact that you've got a guy making this kind of money to just be your pass pro guy. But I just think he does a lot on your team. And if you want to be mad at people, be mad at the Cowboys for paying him two years earlier. Paying him on a contract that they can't necessarily get out of, you're going to have to use him. And by the way, the way you used him worked. Uh, when it comes to the Zeke power debate, and I'm curious how, how you, or what you've heard as relates to my theory. I'm of the mindset that Pollard is so effective because he's not being the true lead back. He doesn't have to carry the ball 25, 20 times a game, isn't out there for 75% of the snaps. I think Pollard's efficiency is greatly increased by how well and how uh, the, the role he has of not having to be the only guy. I'm curious what you think of that, James. 
I also think opposing defenses just don't give Tony Pollard a lot of respect either. Uh, you know, if you think about where he was drafted, he was sort of overlooked, very much like Alvin Kamara was at one point. But I do think, what if the Cowboys were able to use this two running back system the way we saw in New Orleans? That was highly effective. I mean, you've got a lot of guys on this offense that you're going to struggle with. Who do you feed week to week? And maybe that's a good thing where, you know, it was the passing game in week one. It's the running game and pass in, in week two. The one thing that made this team so successful in 2016 was opposing defenses had to pick their poison. They haven't really had to pick their poison a while because you kind of knew exactly what they were doing. If they can make this offense multidimensional and you can have a middle of the pack defense, I think the sky's the limit for this team, especially if we've seen them overcoming the adversity that they have already and the resilience that they've shown. I completely agree there. All right, folks, if you haven't already, hit that big red button and subscribe. Before that, though, as I go and ignore my own script, Pick an RB1 for us, EE -E for Ezekiel Elliott, or type TP for Tony Pollard. Get your votes in for me right now in the comments section. I can't section. wait to see these comments. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be interesting as it always is. Now, before I got ahead of myself, we were going to have you guys subscribe because we've got videos coming out every single day. And thanks to the Boys and Girl podcast coming along here at the Cowboys Report, it's going to be more than one video every single day. So if you want more Cowboys videos from myself and from Jane Slater and Bobby Belt, hit that big red button and subscribe. That way you don't miss out on anything here at the Cowboys Report. All right, Jane, let's talk about Terrence Steele. There was a lot of concern and hand-wringing, including from myself. I thought he played very well against the Chargers, given who he was going up against, too. I told you guys. You know, look, you I initially had the concerns, too. I just happened to have some people I can reach out to and be like, all right, walk me off the ledge. And a lot of people did. It was the work that he put in the offseason. It was Dak Prescott himself who said, look, this guy was in the gym so much, he won one of our offseason awards. There was a commitment to what he was doing. There was also this real sense of don't replace two guys on the offensive line by moving – Zach Martin over to right tackle. Keep him at right guard. He's going to help your young center, Tyler Biotish, settle in, and you're going to help Terrence Steele, and we saw that happen. I mean, if you look at Joey Bosa's game, not exactly bulletin board material for him. Yeah, it was a great showing there out of Terrence Steele. All right, Jane, before you go, do you have any last thoughts on this Cowboys-Eagles game that you want to hit? I want to see the Cowboys have a definitive win for once. I mean, I've loved that they've played close with some of these teams. I don't know if I've loved uh, some of the officiating and the way it's kind of, you know, last week with the Chargers, there were some calls there. I thought that were real ticky-tacky that affects them. I think it, what, blew out, uh, got an 18-yard run, I think, at the end of the game for, or 18-yard touchdown pass for the Chargers that could have resulted in a score. They had to settle for a field goal. Uh, and then, of course, against Tampa to see it come down – you know, to a kick. It's just these, they don't always have to be pretty wins, but I'd, le I'd like to see a pretty win. I'd like to see a win that, that helps me feel a little bit more confident in this team, but I've loved the fight. I've loved the resilience. Uh, I just think it would be really big for the Cowboys to get a signature win under Mike McCarthy at home against a divisional opponent. All right. Thank you so much, Jane. We'll see you again next week for our Cowboys previews throughout the season. Time now for my prediction. As much as I would like to agree with Jane, and I hope that she's right in terms of a not-close game, I think the Cardiac Cowboys will return <laughs> once again. I've got the Cowboys winning 27-23. Maybe it's a garbage time score for Philly, but I think this one comes down to the wire once again. But it's a big win, at least in my prediction, or pr prediction, excuse me, for the Cowboys in Week 3.